vision received was that of blood cells traveling throughout the body, supplying the much needed oxygen and other nutrients to the differing members of the body to fulfill their purpose. Once the blood cells are spent, they must return back to the heart to be refilled before being sent out again and fulfill their purpose. Did you ever wonder, do rabbits lay eggs? And when you found out, maybe, that rabbits actually don't lay eggs, did you ever wonder, why are rabbits found laying eggs during Easter? How is it that rabbits and eggs have anything to do with the Easter holiday? Did it ever occur to you to question, is Easter, this holiday that we celebrate, even found in the Bible? Well, hopefully, as you continue listening to these podcasts, you'll get these questions answered. Hello and welcome to Our Father's Heart podcast. Uh, If you have just entered into our episode today, Uh, you are actually in the middle of a series. And the series is called Now That the Holidays Are Over. And over the last few episodes, we've been looking into the origins and the history of differing holidays. We started with Halloween. uh, We looked into Christmas. And in this particular episode, our focus is going to be on the Easter holiday. And one of the things that I hope all of you that have been with us for at least the last few episodes in considering uh, holidays now that the holidays are over, I hope that as you listen to the podcast that you are seeing a pattern involving the evolution of holidays over the centuries. Because the pattern is very, very Consistent. Halloween's evolution over the years, starting in the 8th, 9th century with the Druid priest, the pattern of its development and how it's been incorporated into the Catholic Church, not Christian, but Catholic Church, and how it was used over time, is really the same pattern that we see in the evolution of the holiday we now know as Christmas, or Christ Mass. And in actuality, the the God that was revered and worshipped actually did not start with the Catholic Church. It actually started with a God that was worshipped and revered all the way back in history to Persia. And it lived on through the Grecian Empire, and it lived on through the Roman Empire. And then it continued to evolve over time through the Catholic Church and what they were trying to do with the pagans and the heathens uh, of their now religious empire. Rather than it being a national kind of military empire of conquest, it became a religious empire. And that religious empire ruled over the Dark Ages, even unto this day. And so I hope that you will also see that pattern in Easter. Because it's pretty clear that that same pattern of evolving of this holiday happened to Easter as well. So if you've been listening to the podcast, you know that a lot of these studies were done... uh, Let me see. It's 2021... These studies were done in around 2008, 2009, and it was very simple. We just simply went to the library, looked in the encyclopedias, looked for books, uh, used the internet as it was back then, um, and a lot of it came from history.com, just to gather facts, just to gather, well, what do historians, as they have compiled their historical information. What have they said and what are the commonalities of the differing researchers and are they confirming one another's quote-unquote stories? And so today, 
As we look in the origins of Easter, we're going to start again with the World Book Encyclopedia. It was the 1989 edition. And it says concerning Easter that it is observed on the first Sunday after the first full moon following the first day of spring. Now, that usually occurs between March 22nd and April 25th. And so some might read that and say, well, why why isn't it the same day every year? Why does it keep changing? And that is because they do it on the first Sunday after the first full moon, which changes year after year because we are not on a 360-day cycle calendar. We're on a 365-day calendar. So that changes. And then every (laughs) four years, we have a leap year. So that, that also changes when this particular holiday is celebrated. Now, looking back in its history, Easter is close to the spring season. And spring is kind of representative of new plants, new life, new new beginnings, if you will. And this actual word Easter comes from the old English word Eastre, E-A-S-T-R-E. And scholars say that Eastre is the name of a pagan goddess of spring. It is also the name of a spring festival, or the name of the season itself. Other scholars believe that Istre comes from the German word Eosterun, E-O-S-T-A-R-U-N, which means dawn. Now, it says here that Christians in European countries called Easter Pascha. This is the Hebrew word for Passover. And so we're going to get to that at the end again. And how is this this Passover apparently supposedly tied to Pascha? And how is it is this even in the Bible? Um, but I would like to mention that every time we looked into the history of the holidays, they kept mentioning Christian or Christianity. And what we really found out was they were actually talking about the Catholic Church. And so when it says Christians in European countries called Easter Pascha, it's talking about Catholicism and those that were adherents or followers of Catholicism in the European countries. And later on during the Protestant Reformation, some of them continued on in those things. So they say, (coughs) excuse me, Christians, but it's actually Catholicism and, and any religious entities that spawned out of Catholicism, which would be the Protestants. So as we look into it more, it also says that the religious observances for Easter by the Roman Catholic Church, by the Anglican Church, by the Lutheran Church, um, celebrated a, a period of 40 days called Lent. And it's patterned after the period that Jesus was tested in the wilderness, because he was tested for 40 days. And they... they take part in this 40-day period because they're preparing for Easter. And it Lent is significant of showing sorrow for sin, seeking forgiveness. It begins with something called Ash Wednesday, where they put ashes on the forehead to remind them that they are but dust. And it's supposed to be the expression of humility. And at the end of the 40 days, it comes within a week. It starts what's called the Holy Week. And it is the final week of Lent. It leads up to Easter. And so Palm Sunday is the first day, and that's kind of representative of Jesus riding on a donkey, uh, you know, riding on, on, on the donkey over the palm trees that are set before him, and they're crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So they start bringing in this, this Christian theme involved in this. And it, it, it's regarding Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem on a donkey. And then it leads into Holy Thursday, which is recalling his Last Supper, which was the Passover meal. And all the decorations are removed, and that's a symbol of stripping Jesus' garments. And then it comes to Good Friday, which is observing the death of Jesus. Uh, it's a day of fasting. It's a morning service. And then it leads into Holy Saturday, which is a solemn vigil held by the Roman Catholic and Orthodox churches. And then it leads into what is you know, known worldwide as Easter Sunday, celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. And many Protestant churches hold Easter sunrise services. And I want to refer back to that in particular 
at the end of this podcast because I think it'll be very revealing because there's something specific in the scriptures uh, talking about a sunrise and the veneration and the, and, and the worship uh, of this sunrise happening. And, and Protestant churches are holding Easter sunrise services where they'll go out early in the morning and they will stand or sit and, and they'll be looking all at the sun as it's rising. And they tie it to, to Easter. And what they say is that it symbolizes the light returning to the world after the darkness of Jesus' death and burial. So they're always taking, um, you know, these rituals, these uh, acts that they do, and they're trying to color it or, or dress it up in a, in a Christian theme from the Christian accounts that come from the Bible, and it makes it seem Christian. But I think we need to go further back, not just where it is right now, not just what people have been doing over the last few centuries, but let's look at back, well, wh where does this idea of Easter come from? Because now they're saying that it's tied to, to kind of his death, his burial, his resurrection, which is in, in the Hebrew, that, that's the Passover. That's when he uh, was crucified. He was crucified uh, during the, the Passover. Um, so some of the symbols that Easter uses is the crucifix and the cross. Obviously, that's referring to Jesus' body hanging on the cross. It's symbolizing his sacrifice. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And, and then we got Sunday around the world. The worship is on Sunday, which is traditionally associated with the day of his resurrection. Uh, many uh, churches will burn candles uh, during their Easter celebrations, their vigils, their midnight services. And they associate this as Jesus being the light of the world. And then obviously, of course, you have the more popular ones. You have these eggs and these rabbits. Now, these symbols are not related to what the Protestants, the Roman Catholic, the Orthodox churches um, title the Easter story. The eggs represent new life. And it is a symbol of spring from ancient times. Rabbits are associated with fertility of spring because rabbits produce many young at one time. And some say that Easter rabbit bunnies lay Easter eggs. Well, biologically speaking, scientifically speaking, that's absolutely not true because rabbits don't lay eggs. And so you have now a mixture happening. Um, but it comes from, as it said, ancient times. And we're going to get into that a, a, a little bit. So I, I, I spoke about a particular word that I wasn't sure if people were aware of, and I kind of defined it in the last podcast. It was amalgamation. And we're seeing it right here, this amalgamation of old ideas, old rituals of worship and symbols that were used like the rabbits about fertility and and uh, being associated with new life and the spring and it's all being associated together with with the eggs as it says here um, which is another sign or a representation of new life so they put the rabbits together with the eggs because they're both kind of talking about new life and the spring and and all of these things so it's being amalgamated but it be it was amalgamated into the catholic church and their um um basically uh, the death burial and resurrection story so then i come to history.com because all of that that i just shared with you came from the World Book Encyclopedia 1989 edition. So after that, we went into history.com. Okay, well, what, what do they say? What, what? And, and the, the good thing about it at that time, we were able to copy-paste straight from history.com. And so even though it says history.com, the information came from an article from Funk and Wagnall's New Encyclopedia, 2005 World Almanac Education Group. So we even got the, you know, the you know, the information of the source uh, material. But according to History.com, the pagan origins of Easter, it says as before, Anglo-Saxon name, Estre was used, E-A-S-T-R-E. -E. But what the previous encyclopedia did not say, that history said was, Estre was the name of a Teutonic goddess. 
of spring and fertility. And the month of April was dedicated to this Teutonic goddess, Istre. Her festival was celebrated on the day of the vernal equinox. Traditions associated with the festival survive in the Easter rabbit, which is a symbol of fertility, in colored eggs, originally painted with bright colors to represent the sunlight of spring and used in Easter egg rolling contests or given as gifts. So right there you see the putting together of of different elements to that are evolving into what we do today. All of this came from ancient times. The Easter rabbit being a symbol of fertility doesn't lay eggs, but somehow, some way, over time, over the evolution, colored Easter eggs, which represent the sunlight of the spring and the new life that was talked about in the previous, are now rolled together. And so now you have rabbits laying eggs, Easter rabbits laying eggs. But all of it is representative of the new life and, and basically the worship of this god, Istre because they had a month in April dedicated to this Teutonic goddess of spring and fertility. So now these festivals and the stories and the legends that explain their origin were all common in ancient religions. A Greek legend, it says, tells of the turn of Persephone, the daughter of Demeter, goddess of the earth, from the underworld to the light of day. Wow, so this goes all the way back to Greek religious beliefs. This idea of, of, of Easter. Now, in their legend, the word Easter wasn't used. There was no name for Easter, but there was an, a character that was worshipped, venerated, celebrated, and her name was Persephone, P-E-R-S-E, P-H-O-N-E, or Persephone. And she's the daughter of Demeter, who was the goddess of the earth, and she came from the underworld into the light of the day. And so her return symbolized to the ancient Greeks the resurrection of life in the spring after the desolation of winter. Many ancient peoples shared similar legends. The Phrygians believed that their omnipotent deity went to sleep at the time of the winter solstice. And they performed ceremonies with music and dancing at the spring equinox to awaken him. So Easter is not solely what we know it today. It just didn't all of a sudden happen within the last 50, 100 years. This is actually an old legend that has evolved over time to what it is that we now experience and know it as today. So now what it calls the Christian festival, I I call it the Catholic festival of Easter, uh, embodies a number of converging, it says, converging traditions. And that's where I, I use that word amalgamation. <clears throat> Most scholars emphasize that the original relation of Easter to the Jewish festival of Passover or Pesach. So scholars have now tied Easter together with the Jewish festival of Passover. So you see, I, if, you, if you look at what we just shared here, Easter has always been about new life. It's always been about new fertility. But scholars have seen and have emphasized the relationship between Easter and the Jewish festival of Passover or Pasach. If you know anything about the Bible, Passover was about death. It was about the angel of death passing over Egypt. And the Israelites put the blood on the doorpost in obedience to God's word through Moses so that when the angel of death passed over them, their firstborn child would not die. But wherever that blood was not on the doorpost, for the rest of the Egyptians, their firstborn died. So Passover for them was was a 
was connected to the idea of when that angel of death passed over. But looking at it from a Hebrew into a Christian view, Passover was now signified or tied to the death of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so you have two conflicting ideas being merged together. Easter, through all the ancient legends and ancient uh, uh, histories, has always been about for fertility, about new life, about the spring, and now it's being attached and morphed together into Passover, which the Catholic Church has continued to use the word Easter, not Passover. The early Christians, many of who were from Jewish origin, were brought up with the Hebrew tradition and regarded Easter as a new feature of this Passover festival, a commemoration of the advent of the Messiah as foretold by the prophets. So again, early on, uh, there were Christians of, of Jewish descent, um, and, and so they were tying those ideas together. Again, this all came from history.com, and so... I'm just going to take a few moments to just look into the specific Easter symbols and maybe find some more information. Again, this that I am sharing with you all comes from an article from Funk and Wagnall's New Encyclopedia 2005 World Almanac Education Group. And so if you want to confirm what I'm sharing, go right ahead. I, I don't mind. I really don't mind. I hope that you do. I challenge you to look into the history and the origins of these holidays yourself, and you will find out that they're not as Christian as, they're, as they claim to be. They're actually just outrightly pagan. They're outrightly heathen. They're outrightly the practices of Gentiles and their worship and veneration of other gods. So let me go back to the Easter bunny. The Bible makes no mention of a long-eared, short-tailed creature who delivers colored eggs to well-behaved children on Easter Sunday. Nevertheless, it is says the Easter Bunny has become a prominent symbol of Christianity's most important holiday. The exact origins of this mythical mammal are unclear, but rabbits are known as prolific procreators. They are an ancient symbol of fertility and life. According to, the, to some sources, the bunny arrived, the Easter bunny arrived in America in the 1700s with German immigrants who settled in Pennsylvania. And they obviously brought along their traditions of an egg-laying hare called Osterhaze or Osterhaus. Osterhaze is spelled O-S-T-E-R-H-A-S-E. And Oshterhaz is spelled O-S-C-H-T-E-R-H-A-W-S. -E and it furthermore says that the children may nest for the creatures who would lay their colored eggs. The custom spread across the U.S. and the fabled rabbit's Easter morning deliveries expanded to include chocolate and other types of candy and gifts while decorated baskets replaced the nests. Children often left out carrots for the bunny in case he got hungry from all of his hopping. So again, we see that our Easter as we celebrate it today actually has, has some of its influential roots from those immigrants that were German from the 1700s, and they brought along this tradition with them. And then we in America morphed it, incorporated into what we do today. So let's look at the Easter eggs. Um... Easter eggs, it flat out says, are, are, are likely linked to pagan traditions. The egg is an ancient symbol of noon life. It has been associated with pagan festivals celebrating spring. And now from a, wait, wait, it says a Christian perspective, and again, I say this from a Catholic perspective because of what the Catholic Church did early on, uh, which we'll get to in just a little bit, uh, when they took the ancient pagan rituals and, and, and practices to amalgamate them into their own religious beliefs in the Catholic Church to get those pagans and heathens into the church, this is kind of the thing that evolved into. So what they're saying is that 
from this Christian perspective, Easter eggs are representative of Jesus' emergence from the tomb and resurrection. Decorating the eggs for Easter as a tradition dates back to the 13th century, it says, according to some sources. One explanation for this custom is that eggs were formerly forbidden food during the Lenten season, so people would paint and decorate them to mark the end of the period of penance and fasting. Again, that goes back to the 40 days of Lent. And then they would eat them on Easter as a celebration. So we have Easter egg hunts. We have egg rolling. And these are two popular egg-related traditions. In the U.S., the White House Easter egg roll, which was a race in which children pushed decorated hard-boiled eggs across the the house, uh, the White House lawn, was an annual event held the Monday after Easter. And so th- that brings in just how our culture kind of appropriated into its, you know, regular uh, everyday events. And some people say that the s- symbol of rolling those eggs is, again, they're just trying to incorporate Christian and kind of paint over it or dress it up in Christian themes. They're saying that this egg rolling is like the stone that was blocking Jesus' tomb that was rolled away. All right, so... We go to back to that, what, what the encyclopedia, what the World Book Encyclopedia told us at the very beginning about this Holy Week. So Holy Week um, is the week pre- immediately preceding Easter. It begins with Palm Sunday, um, and the rites are observed commemorating the passion, the death, the resurrection of, of Christ. Again, all of these are words that you find in the Catholic Church, the passion of Christ. Um, it says there are special observances recalling the institution of the Eucharist that are held on Maundy Thursday. There are scripture readings, solemn prayers, veneration of the cross, the recall of the crucifixion of Christ on Good Friday. And then Holy Saturday commemorates the burial of Christ. So all of this is just reemphasizing and just confirming what we read of in the encyclopedia, the World Book Encyclopedia. So Holy Week is sometimes called the Great Week by the Roman Catholic and Orthodox Church because it commemorates the great deeds of God for mankind. Now, you guys may have heard of Mardi Gras. Mardi Gras is a part of this. You may or may not have known. I mean, in America, Mardi Gras is a very popular, you know, celebration festival that's held in Louisiana. And some people know and some people may not know that it is part of this uh, celebration, this Holy Week. And so Roman Catholic countries and communities also celebrate Mardi Gras. Mardi Gras is not just held in Louisiana. It is held, according to these records, in New Orleans, in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, in Nice, France, and in Cologne, Germany. I don't know if I said Cologne right, but it's C-O-L-O-G-N-E. I think it's Cologne. (laughs) Um, So... They celebrate this Mardi Gras immediately before Ash Wednesday, which is the start of the fast of Lent. <laughs> so it's like it's like this celebration is the last opportunity for them to party hard until they have their 40 days of fasting. Uh, so it, it actually even says that in the next paragraph, Mardi Gras is the last opportunity for merrymaking and indulgence in food and drink. The festival is generally celebrated one full week before Lent. So they got to have a full week of party hardy fast, uh, 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 party hardy uh, uh, indulgences because when Lent comes, they're going to have to drop all of that. So Mardi Gras is marked by spectacular parades, floats, pageants, elaborate costumes, mass balls, people dancing in the streets. And if you know anything about Mardi Gras in Louisiana, it's, it's, it's not kosher to say the least. So then we go to Ash Wednesday. Ash Wednesday is, in many Catholic churches, the first day of penitential season of Lent. They place ashes on the forehead as a sign of penitence, a sign of regret, remorse, uh, repentance. Uh, It says here that the custom was probably introduced by Pope Gregory I and has been universal since the Synod of Benevento in 1091 AD. So the Roman Catholic Church has been practicing this Ash Wednesday for 
about a thousand years almost. Almost nearly a thousand years if this uh, record is, is accurate. So it says in the Roman Catholic Church, the ashes obtained from burned palm branches on the previous Palm Sunday, if you remember that it's part of a Holy Week, um, and they place them on the foreheads on Ash Wednesday. Of the officiating priest, the clergy, the congregation, and they recite over each one the following form, remember that you are dust and unto dust you shall return. And so that's where that comes from. And then obviously you have Lent, which is a period of fasting and penitence, um, observed in preparation for Easter. Um, during this uh, Lenten fast, th uh, there's, you, there's eating is sparing or you're cutting out certain uh, items. It says here is established in the 4th century. Wow, that's interesting. The 4th century. If you listen to the other podcast, Christmas was established in the 4th century. It says it was established through the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. If you remember, you can go back and listen to it, but I'll just repeat it again. So I wouldn't be surprised if it was this same council that this was established, as it says here. In Eastern churches, where both Saturdays and Sundays are regarded as festival days, the period of Lent is eight weeks before Easter. In Western churches, where there is only one, there where only Sunday is regarded as a festival, then the 40-day period begins on Ash Wednesday and just extends with the omission of Sundays to the day before Easter. It says here that the Roman Catholic Church has in recent years relaxed its laws on fasting. And according to Pope Paul the Sixth in February 1966, fasting and absence, abstinence during Lent are obligatory only on Ash Wednesday and Good Friday. All right, so uh, I guess 40 days was too long for them. And so uh, the Pope said, no, 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 we could just do it Ash Wednesday and Good Friday. And then there was this term Maundy Thursday. That's also known as Holy Thursday, the Thursday before Easter Sunday. It's a commemoration of Christ's Last Supper. And in Roman Catholic and Protestant churches, the Eucharist is celebrated in, the, in an evening liturgy that includes Holy Communion. Uh, during the Roman Catholic liturgy, the ceremony of the washing of the feet, or pedilavium is a, a word for it, is performed. The celebrant washes the feet of 12 people to commemorate Christ's washing of his disciples' feet. In an English custom, uh, it survives by giving alms, mondi pennies, to the poor. This act recalls an earlier practice in which the sovereign washed the feet of the poor on Maundy Thursday. And then we come to Good Friday. Friday is immediately preceding Easter, celebrated by many Catholics and Protestants and different Christian uh, denominations and organizations worldwide. It's the anniversary of Christ's crucifixion. Uh, the name Good Friday is believed to be a corruption of God's Friday. Since the time of the early church, the day has been dedicated to penance, fasting, and prayer. So furthermore, the Roman Catholic Church the Good Friday Liturgy is composed of three distinct parts, um, including the reading of the Passion, the veneration of the cross, and the general communion service. Now, from the 16th century on, Good Friday service took place in the morning. In 1955, Pope Pius XII decreed that it be held in the afternoon or the evening. So traditional afternoon devotions as the Treore, which is Italian for three hours, consisting of sermons, meditations, and prayers sending on the three-hour agony of Christ on the cross were almost entirely discontinued in the Roman Catholic Church. But in most Europe, South American, Great Britain, and many parts of the Commonwealth and several states of the U.S., Good Friday is a legal holiday. Okay? So as I come to a close, According to the New Testament, again, still from Funk and Wagnall's New Encyclopedia, 2005, World Almanac Education Edition, uh, Christ was crucified on the eve of Passover. Shortly afterward, within three days, he rose from the dead. And so the Easter festival commemorates Christ's resurrection. 
A serious difference over the date of Easter festivals arose among the Christians because those of Jewish origin celebrated the resurrection immediately following the Passover festival. Now, you could understand why Jewish Christians would be strong or firm about that. Because if you just read the scriptures in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts, or not Acts, but Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels that focused on Christ's life and, and death, he was crucified right after the Passover meal. And then he stayed three days in the tomb and rose again on the third day. So it would make sense why they say, hey, quote unquote, Easter has to be done right after Passover. Right after the Passover, Thursday and Friday, it's got to be right after that. Whereas the other believers, um, they, mo they, they moved the date of Easter, not according to Passover, but what? According to the moon. Remember, it's always celebrated on the first Sunday after the first full moon. So again, that traces back to this is how it was celebrated in ancient times. So for the Jews, it fell on the evening of the full moon of the 14th day in the month of Nisan, the first month of the year. Easter from year to year for others fell on different days of the week because they were basing it upon the cycle of the moon. Now, Christians of Gentile origin wish to commemorate the resurrection on the first day of the week, Sunday, by their method. Easter occurred on the same day of the week, but from year to year fell on different dates. The important historical result of the difference in reckoning the date of Easter was that Christian churches in the East, which were closer to the birthplace, of the new religion in which old traditions were strong observed Easter according to the date of the Passover festival. But the churches of the West, descendants of Greco-Roman civilization, celebrated Easter on Sunday. Now, this is where this Catholic church influence comes apart and again. And I think this is important because, again, we're trying to look for those patterns. It says, Constantine I, Roman emperor, convoked the Council of Nicaea in 325. What century is that? Oh yeah, that's right, the 4th century. The council unanimously ruled that Easter festivals should be celebrated throughout the Christian world, which for them was the Roman Catholic uh, uh, world, on the first Sunday after the full moon following the vernal equinox. Again, completely taken from pagan religious practices and rituals. And that if the full moon should occur on Sunday and thereby coincide with the Passover festival, Easter should be commemorated on the Sunday following. So that the celebration according to Constantine the first, the Roman emperor, would not conflict with the Passover that Jewish Christians were participating in. So, the Council of Nicaea also decided that the calendar date of Easter was to be calculated at Alexandria. And then it became kind of impossible to determine the date um, due to the limited knowledge of 4th century world. So the principal astronomical problem involved was the discrepancy called the epact between the solar year and the lunar year. And so they ended up making that decision, and that's why. So that's basically my notes on Easter. And so I want you, as you think about these things, I want you to consider a few things. It was mentioned that well, let me start with what I've said probably in the previous two podcasts. I think Jeremiah chapter 10, verses 1 through 5, but for me specifically verses 1 and 2 are really, really important when we are considering our um, participation as biblical Christians. It says... Again, hear the word of the Lord which speaks 
to you. Jeremiah 10, 1 through 5, O house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, do not learn the way of the Gentiles. Do not be dismayed at the signs of the heaven, for the Gentiles are dismayed. For the customs of the people are futile. That goes right into verse 3. There is a reason why the Israelites, the Hebrews, the Jews of the Old Covenant did not participate in the pagan, heathen, religious practices of the nations that surrounded them. They were commanded of God not to partake in them. If you know anything of the Old Covenant, you realize why that was a stipulation by God, because it caused them to stray from the commandments of the Lord. It caused them to not fear the Lord, their God, their Creator. They began fearing other gods and idols of other nations. And, and, and in, in the history of Israel, they knew there's only one God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That is our God. That is our Creator. Not just our Creator, but the Creator of the whole world and all the other nations. Because all the other nations came from Adam and Eve. What they're doing is, is, is so far away and is, it is an expression of how far they are from their creator because they are actually acknowledging and venerating other gods of their own imagination, other gods of their own creation. And they ended up worshiping the creation more than the creator. Now that was said. Now, one thing I want to, or a couple things I also want to address. Remember, we just read in the Almanac how many Protestant Christian churches are having sunrise services where they are looking and having a, 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 a specific service as the sun rises in the east. I want you to consider this particular scripture in reference to that. It's found in Ezekiel chapter 8. And if you read Ezekiel chapter 8, there's actually three to four abominations that were happening secretly, hiddenly, in, within the, the people and the community of God and in the temple and among the priests. And it is this specific one that I believe applies to what Protestant Christian churches, as it's been designated by the encyclopedia are doing in, in their Easter Sunday sunrise worship service. In Ezekiel chapter 8, 16 through 17, it says, So he brought me, meaning Ezekiel, into the inner court of the Lord's house. So Ezekiel is brought into the temple, into the Lord's house, and there he is shown something. It says, And there, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about 25 men, with their backs toward the temple of the Lord. Their backs were toward the temple, but you know where their faces were? Their faces were toward the east, and they were worshiping the sun toward the east. And he said to me, meaning the Lord, have you seen this, O son of man? Is it a trivial thing to the house of Judah to commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence. Then they have returned to provoke me to anger. Indeed, they put the branch to their nose. This was hundreds, thousands of years ago. If this is Ezekiel, this is literally over 2,000 Five, six, probably five, 2,500, 600, 700 years ago. And the Lord was already telling him that my people are turning their backs to the temple of the Lord. They are facing the east and they are worshiping the sun. Why does that look like what the Protestant Christian churches are doing on Easter? 
Is it perhaps that they have fallen into something, maybe in ignorance, maybe unbeknownst to them, that is very similar to something that was done in the past with the people of God? I submit it to you for your consideration. I submit it to you for you to simply take it before the Lord and say, does this have any bearing on participating in Easter? And then I, I do want to come back to that, uh, that question I began with. Is Easter even in the Bible? Well, I will say yes, and I will say no. And here's why. Depending upon the translation that you use, of the Bible, if you're one of those that, that really, really strongly believe that the King James Version is the authoritative version, that's the one you got to use, well, that's the version where the word Easter is used. But when you read it and you do a little bit more uh, research and delve a little bit more deeply, you realize that the word Easter there is a mistranslation. But if, you, if, you, if you've listened to this whole podcast and all that I've shared, you understand why Easter was used in that particular sense because the KJV version was translated uh, uh, around the late 1500s, early 1600s, and so we have the authorized King James Version, 1611. Okay, right around then is when this word was put there and used. But if you look a little bit more deeply as I'll do right now, it's in Acts chapter 10, 12, verse 5. And the only reason that the word Easter we use because it was describing uh, the timing of what was happening in the context, which is when Peter was in prison. And it says, Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God. And in verse 4, that's what I meant to read. I actually read verse 5. But in verse 4, it says, And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison, meaning uh, Peter, and delivered him to the quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. That's the only mention of Easter. It's letting the reader know that when Peter was apprehended and was held by the quaternions of soldiers, that it was during the time of Easter. But if you just look a little bit more deeply, and all you have to do is use Strong's Concordance, if you look for that word, the actual Hebrew word is Pascha, Passover which is to say that when he was apprehended and held by the four quaternions of soldiers, it was during the Passover. Peter was not the traveling missionary like Paul was. Peter, basically his ministry was headquartered and centered in Jerusalem. Well, if you know anything of the Bible and anything of the Feast of the Lord, which is another question I'm going to ask everyone at the end, um, you'll know that that is something that they continued celebrating, the Feast of the Lord. And one of those feasts was Passover. So that's all that, 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 that it was about. It was just letting you know when he was held. He was held around the Passover. And they were holding him during that time until the Passover passed. That's the only time Easter is used in the Bible. But is this celebration of Easter as we know it today... Do we find the apostles of the first century and the Christians of the first century celebrating this? No, we don't, we don't see that at all. And so I want to leave you with a couple of questions. Do you know what are the God-ordained holidays? Like, what are the holidays or the feasts or the festivals that God has ordained in the scriptures? Because in the Old Covenant, he definitely did. Does anybody know what they are? Does anybody here listening, do you know how many of them there are? Can you name them? Can you, can you tell yourself, oh yeah, there's this many. And then as you think about that, and as I let this time tick by, then ask yourself, if you cannot name the feast of the Lord, the celebrations of the Lord that he wanted his people 
to partake in. The the question is, well, why do you not know what the celebrations of the Lord are or how many of them there are? But you know so much more about these other holidays that, as we've seen over the last three episodes, are rooted, are deeply rooted in pagan, heathen customs and rituals. Maybe we'll touch upon that in the next podcast as to what those feasts are, but I'll just challenge you to find out what they are and find out maybe how you should be participating in the celebrations and the feast of the Lord. Thus is the ministry of our Father's heart through us. Our utmost desire is to be in the Father's heart, to know the Father's heart, and express the Father's heart to you. If you appreciate listening to this podcast and we're blessed, pass it along to someone else by text, email, or word of mouth in the hopes that they might be positively impacted as you were. If you are interested in supporting our efforts, we would ask you to consider the following. One, pray for us. Two, leave a positive rating or review with whomever you listen to our podcast with. And three, if you desire to contribute monetarily, you can do so at paypal.me slash jbenjesus or cash app dollar sign jbenjesus or Venmo jbenjesus. That's J. B-E-N-J-E-S-U-S. God bless.